Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm here with Dr. Stephen Law. He is formerly reader in philosophy at Athrop College, and before that he was research fellow at the Queen's College, Oxford. He is currently editor of the Royal Institute of Philosophy journal, Think. He has published several books, including a couple of them that I'm going to refer to, namely The Philosophy Gym, A Very Short Introduction to Humanism, and Believing Bullshit. He was also a fellow of the Royal Institute of Arts and Commerce, and in 2008 he became the provost of the Centre for Inquiry UK. So, Dr. Law, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Not at all. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Okay, great. So, okay, so let us start with this, because I guess that in your books and in your work, you go a lot through what we call uh, liberalism. But just before that, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what are the limitations of the naturalistic approach when it comes to obtaining knowledge and making decisions that regard human affairs? Because I guess that when it comes to human affairs is really where we need some we need to get into things like moral philosophy and and it partially gets outside of the of the of strictly the scientific method right yeah so um i would say that these words naturalism naturalistic method uh, mm -hmm. Science, scientism, um, these words are bandied around a lot, aren't they? And, um, and, and often in, in various different ways. So the debate can quickly become quite confusing. So let me just say something about something fairly general about the role of philosophy in science as I see it. So mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that science is um, a, a comparatively recent phenomenon if, if we understand science as an application of the scientific method mm -hmm. because that method has only been around really in a sophisticated form for, for, for just a few hundred years, four or five hundred years. So science is a comparatively recent phenomenon but of course incredibly powerful. It's completely transformed our lives in that very short period of time. There's, it's, right. it's, there's no doubt that it's an amazing tool. Um, so there's science and then there's perhaps what we could call empiricism which is the view that um, if you want to know about the world around you, then you need to engage your senses, observation. That's really our only window onto reality. So if you want to know about the fundamental nature of reality, you're going to have to appeal to observation. Uh, you're going to have to engage in some sort of empirical inquiry. Um, now, Empirical inquiry is much broader then than science. Empirical mm -hmm. inquiry has been around for thousands of years. Uh, science is a comparatively recent development. So it follows then that there are all sorts of things that you can know and establish empirically, right, without appealing to science. So that's the first clarification I'd want to want to make. Mm -hmm. And then as a philosopher, you would probably expect me to say that there are also things that um, can be known, figured out, a priori, you know, from the comfort of your armchair, just by having a good old think. You know, you can close your eyes, put your earplugs in. You don't need to engage your senses. Just by reflecting, there are questions that you can potentially answer. Um, there are things that you can find out. There's knowledge that can be acquired in that way. Um, and in fact, I do believe that. So that means then that I, um, I, I certainly reject scientism, understood mm -hmm. the view that you know you have to do not just empirical inquiry but apply the scientific method to find out anything at all to to obtain knowledge. Um, so I, I reject that view. Um, I believe that you can acquire knowledge just by sitting and reflecting. Obviously, I as a philosopher, I think that there are things we can figure out and know in that way. Um, but I'm not so, but I kind of lean in the direction, to be honest, of empiricism. Uh, now, empiricism is the view that knowledge of 
external reality right can only be had by engaging in observation empirical mm-hmm. inquiry and actually I, I I do lean in that direction a bit I have to say I'm not sure that armchair reflection is any good at all at revealing the fundamental nature of reality right there are things it can reveal but I'm not sure that that's one of them. I suspect you probably do have to engage in observation to reveal the fundamental nature of reality. So what kind of things then could you establish from the comfort of your armchair? Well, there's mathematics, of course, that's an armchair discipline, isn't it? Um, and there's mathematical knowledge that you can have a priori. I, I, that's not scientific knowledge mm-hmm. understood um, if we understand science in the way that I just did, you know, an application of the scientific method as it's been developed over the last few hundred years. Um, and there are many other things that you can figure out. So, I don't know, one of my favourite examples is a, is a puzzle involving, I've lost, I had it written down a second ago and I managed to lose it. But anyway, a puzzle, see if I can remember it, the puzzle, the puzzle is this, could you have um, a mother and a father and a son and a daughter and a niece and a nephew and um, uncle and aunt, could you have all of those relations at a family gathering, a family party that involves just four people? Now, most people will probably think, well, without thinking about it too much, they'll, 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 they'll think, well, on the face of it, no, there's going to have more than just four. Conceptually, for all those connections to be in place, you need more people than that. So there's going to, there appears to be, there appears to be a sort of conceptual obstacle so they're just being four people. There's going to have to be, you know, it's conceptually required that there be more people than that. Um, but actually, if you think it through, you realise that no, actually, you just need um, a mother, a mother and a father, and uh, a son and a daughter, and that's it. You can you can get all those connections in place. So, by thinking now, that's a puzzle, a famous little puzzle that you can figure out the answer to from the comfort of your armchair we know the answer now okay we spelt it out how did we did we apply science no not in the sense that I, we defined it earlier uh, did we engage in empirical observation no we didn't mean to do that it's just an armchair puzzle um, it's a conceptual puzzle in fact what it what, it, what appeared to be the case there appeared to be a sort of conceptual obstacle didn't there there had to, to, to there just being four people. There had to be more people than that. It, it turns out on closer examination, no, there could just be four people. Now, philosophical puzzles often, perhaps typically, arguably always, have this character. They're conceptual puzzles. So, for example, you might think about the mind and the body, famous, famous philosophical puzzle. It strikes people that it's not... It, you know, science cannot establish that mind and body are identical because there's some sort of deeper conceptual obstacle to minds and bodies being one and the same thing. We can just know from the comfort of our armchairs that the mind cannot possibly be the body, the brain. But then it may turn out <laughs> by doing a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of conceptual unpacking, that actually, although it looks like there's a conceptual obstacle, there isn't really a conceptual obstacle. Actually, these two things could, in fact, be one and the same thing. Just as it, you know, little conceptual unpacking reveals that there could just be four people at that party. So, you know, you can solve philosophical puzzles. We have solved them. We do make philosophical progress. So philosophy is an armchair discipline. Uh, it can provide knowledge. It's not empirical, typically. Um, it's not an application of science. Scientism is false. Um, I think I've provided a pretty full answer to your to your question. Hopefully my mm-hmm. view is now a bit clearer. You can see why I'm a philosopher, but I still kind of lean in the direction of empiricism, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, but I, I mean, when it comes to human affairs and perhaps even things related to morality and how we should structure our societies and things like that, it is very common for people to think that perhaps in those cases, uh, whatever the decisions we make in terms of the philosophies that should guide us and our behavior, that science cannot really prove uh, any one of them as right or wrong in a strictly empirical way. Is that correct? That is a very common view, and the usual 
argument for that is is basically you know Hume's argument that um, morality concerns um, facts about what we ought or ought not to do, ought facts if you like. Mm -hmm. Whereas science, it appears, can reveal in the first instance only how things actually are. There is facts, you know, there is right. blood and there is screaming and so on, right? Those facts that science can establish, but that we ought or ought not to engage in this behaviour, that's a categorically different kind of a claim. And the suggestion then is that um, premises concerning what is the case will never rationally support a conclusion about what one ought or ought not to do, not by themselves, not unless you smuggle some other ought claims into your premises. So um, if that's true, and a lot of philosophers accept that that is true, I think I'm inclined to think that it's correct, um, then you will take the view that science cannot answer our fundamental moral questions, which is not to say that science is irrelevant to morality. It's very relevant indeed, because very often the conclusions that we draw about morality are based in part on beliefs about how the world is and how the world works. So you might think, for example, that the right thing to do is to help human beings flourish. That's what we ought to do. Mm -hmm. We're agreed about that. But now we might disagree about what will help human beings flourish. And in fact, we will probably need to engage in some empirical inquiry now to establish what actually really does work in terms of enabling human flourishing and so on. It might turn out that some of the things that we believed are not true. Science might perhaps establish that. And so our moral perspective can and should be scientifically informed. That's true. But fundamentally, right, um, it cannot just by itself, it cannot justify any moral position. I, 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 yeah, I'm inclined to accept that view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. but I mean, we could determine as a goal that we we should look for human flourishing or to try to attain it. But I mean, uh, wouldn't that be a sort of a priori moral axiom that we had to define and then with yeah. that in place we would empirically look at the data and that what happens in the world to see if what we are doing is is benefiting that sort of uh, moral philosophy or, or not I, I mean we we can't simply through empirical methods establish uh, moral axioms. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you could have a, a, a little simple argument that says we ought to do whatever uh, enables human beings to flourish. Um, and now that that's that's perhaps not the scientific premise. That's just a priori. We help mm -hmm. ourselves to that. Then we help ourselves to the second premise that doing so and so aids human flourishing. Now that one, that's that's based on observation. And so we're combining empirical premises and non-empirical premises in order to generate the conclusion that and this is how then we should uh, run our society or whatever it might happen to be. And that's so the reason that science is is relevant to the conclusion is because one one of the premises um, was the, in the province of science, uh, but the other one arguably was not. Uh, what if it's sort of a basic, fundamental uh, moral principle? Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when it comes to relativism, because I guess that are, there are some people that uh, when we're talking about human affairs and morality and things like that, because they can't be solved uh, strictly on the basis of applying scientific principles, let's say, they deny uh, completely uh, things like moral realism and things like that, and perhaps embrace at least to some extent uh, things like moral relativism. But I, I guess that there are some uh, philosophical flaws with uh, pro, uh, with relativism when it is applied either to uh, a epistemology or even to morality, right? Yeah, so there certainly are, I mean, I don't have a worked out view about mm -hmm. the nature of morality. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I admit that I'm fairly confused. Um, I, I, I am inclined to go with the sort of Humean point that science by itself cannot, in isolation, can't provide mm -hmm. answers to more questions. Right. Um, at the same time, though, um, I don't like relativism if relativism is the view that every moral perspective is equally valid, equally good, that morality just boils down to a matter of subjective taste or preference. Um, that strikes me as highly implausible. Other views, uh, other radical views, um, I find slightly more plausible than that. I mean, moral nihilism, the view that there just is no moral truth, um, that has possibly a little bit more going for it mm -hmm. um, than moral relativism, the view that mm -hmm. there is moral truth, but it's relative to individuals, and mm -hmm. that what's true for one individual may be false for another, and the truth is whatever you believe it to be. Okay? Um, the obvious problems with that are, well, pretty much everyone accepts that, um, you know, to pick the most cliched example, you know, murdering, <laughs> murdering lots and lots of Jewish people in the Holocaust, okay? We would have to accept that um, if the Nazis thought that that was morally acceptable, then then that's true for them. And who are we, you know, who who are we to disagree with right. different view? But the fact is that there's no objective truth of the matter. So almost no one really accepts that. Almost no one accepts moral relativism. It also has the consequence that there's no point in thinking about morality because whatever conclusion you come to after deep, careful thought will be no more true than the one you started with. So why bother thinking about it? There is no point in thinking about it. So yeah, so moral relativism has various highly implausible <laughs> consequences that almost no one is willing to accept. Um, so I reject that. But I don't actually have, um, I have to admit, <laughs> a, a worked out moral theory. I am quite confused about morality. Um, I just know that that particular view is on, you know, highly unlikely to be correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so could you now tell us about liberalism and perhaps what are some of the main tenets of it? And, and I guess that in your work you put a lot of emphasis in distinguishing the approach that liberal, liberalism has to freedom of thought and pitting it against freedom of action, correct? Yeah, so... I wrote a book looking at moral and religious education. Mm -hmm. uh, the book was called The War for Children's Minds, mm -hmm. in which I do talk, I do use this word uh, liberalism, um, but I use it as a term of art, really, in a very specific mm -hmm. way, probably not a way that most people would recognize uh, immediately. So maybe I should just exp explain what I, what I was thinking about. So what, what was... Uh, bothering me when I wrote this book um, in particular were various arguments that I would see uh, in the media, on TV, reading newspapers and so on, um, w along the lines of, um, well, um, we need to get uh, authority back into the classroom. You know, we, we used to have children deferring to those who know the answers to moral questions, those with moral expertise, um, they, they realized that their job was to more or less passively accept the traditional morality that was handed down to them from one generation to the next. And uh, what with the Enlightenment, which encourages individuals to start thinking for themselves and make their own moral judgments rather than defer to tradition, and then the 1960s, often gets the blame at this point, um, further liberalization and people being encouraged to make up their, make their own judgments and not just defer to tradition and authority. Um, we now have a situation in which um, individuals are kind of free-floating moral atoms. They've lost their moral compass, right, which was traditionally provided by authority and uh, tradition. And consequently, we're going to hell in a handbasket. You know, morality is Morality is uh, crumbling away. The fabric of Western civilization is under threat. Um, we need to do something. Bring back authority. It will save us. Get to, in particular, bring authority back into the classroom. So you find this kind of argument peddled by all sorts of people, um, uh, social and religious conservatives. Um, and uh, it's a terrible, 
argument, in my view. And it was really that argument uh, that I wanted to tackle in this book. And so the way I set the debate up in the book is between liberals and authoritarians of a particular sort. So a liberal with a capital L, on my use, is someone that thinks that young people, citizens, should be raised to be independent critical thinkers who take on the responsibility for making their own moral judgments and whilst no doubt looking to tradition and authorities and so on, ult ultimately make up their own minds rather than more or less passively accept whatever they are told. That's the liberal tradition. Um, and of course that is a tradition, it goes all the way back to ancient Greece. It's got its own, it's got its own tradition in fact. And then there's the authoritarian with a capital A who says that no, the right attitude to instill in young people is an attitude of deference to authority and tradition. You know, we know what's true. They should just accept what we tell them is true in much the same way as they should accept what a professor of chemistry tells them or, or whatever it might happen to be. Their job is not to question and make their own judgment. They should accept the judgment of uh, authority with a capital A. And there's no doubt that we have, as a society, moved from a more authoritarian tradition when it comes to morality and religious belief to a, a much more liberal uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and many, some people think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I defend it in my book. Other people think that that's a terribly dangerous thing and they are, they're arguing uh, against it. But that, that's how I'm using this word liberal with a capital L. And as you mentioned in your question, there are other ways of using the term. And so <clears throat> you can also be, so what I'm talking about there, I guess, is freedom of thought and expression. Mm -hmm. I think we should be liberal in the sense that people should be encouraged to think for themselves, make their own judgments, express their own point of view, and not just have socks stuffed in their mouth when they start to dissent. Um, and, but there's another kind of liberal authoritarian debate, which is about behavior. Mm -hmm. about what we allow people to do. Um, so you can have a school that is very liberal with a capital L in the sense that it encourages pupils to think and question and express dissent and so on, um, you know, in, in the appropriate forums. But it's nevertheless very strict when it comes to behaviour. You know, they ha you have to wear the uniform, no running in the corridors, everyone has to be well turned out and no swearing and so on. There could be a, a very rigid set of rules imposed on us as pupils, um, even whilst the school is actually very liberal with a capital L. So it's authoritarian with a small a, if you like, when it comes to behaviour, but liberal with a capital L when it comes to freedom of thought and expression. That's an obvious thing, distinction we can make. I mean, in the, UK, in the United Kingdom, it's illegal to drive at more than 70 miles an hour in your car, but it's not illegal to say <laughs> you should be allowed to drive at more than 70 miles an hour in your car. I mean, there's a clear distinction we can make between freedom of thought and expression, freedom of behaviour. Clearly the two are linked, uh, causally even, but um, you know, it's a, it's a conceptual distinction we can make. And so um, whilst I'll acknowledge that, you know, maybe there needs to be more discipline in schools, I'll give you that if you like, right? Um, my point is that we need a very liberal with a capital L educational environment when it comes to morality and religious belief. Children need to understand that it is their free choice to believe or not to believe in God, to accept this or that religion, uh, that it is their moral responsibility to you know, think about what they ought and ought not to do and so on. And there's even good empirical evidence, get back to empirical, that if you raise young people in that way, um, they're going to be more immune to the kind of moral catastrophes that we saw unfold during the 20th century. So, you know, you saw horrible things going on um, under Stalin and Mao and Hitler and, and then earlier under religious regimes. Um, what all of those individuals have in common, some are atheists, some are religious, but what they all have in common is they're all authoritarians with a capital A. Um, mm -hmm. They were all highly oppressive. They all thought to police thought. Um, the people that rescued Jews during the Holocaust, on the other hand, uh, the evidence strongly suggests that those people rescued Jews primarily because of the way they were raised, raised in a liberal, capital L kind of way, raised to think and question rather than just passively accept what they were told about morality. So it seems, if you want, it seems to me that if you want to immunise young people against 
those kind of moral catastrophes, you should raise them to be enlightened with a capital E citizens in the sense that, you know, in the Kantian sense that they have been encouraged to dare to think for themselves, uh, ask questions, don't just passively accept, but, you know, take on the responsibility to make your own moral judgment. I think there's a very good case for an education system based on that principle. Mm -hmm. So you referred several times to religious, uh, to re religion, sorry, and to religious thought and things like that. So I would like to ask you because I guess that religion is somewhat of a complicated issue, particularly in modern scientific societies. Because I, I mean, uh, we tend to associate religious people with authoritarianism and conservatism and things like that. But isn't it the case that someone can have a religion and be a religious person while at the same time being liberal? Yes, exactly right. So, um, so the way that I explain this in the book is I have like two axes, a left-right axis, which is uh, the authoritarian liberal axis, so you can be very liberal over to the left, authoritarian over to the right, and then you can be religious or atheist, top to bottom. And then you can locate individuals on, on, on this little grid that we've constructed. Um, so obviously there are authoritarian atheists, Stalin and Mao, brutally authoritarian. Um, there are authoritarian religious people who want to police your thoughts. Um, so you know, traditionally, Catholic Church has been pretty oppressive. The Holy Inquisition was very much about policing people's thoughts, and uh, you know, those those thoughts were pretty brutally policed. Um, but then you can also have liberal atheists like me and Richard Dawkins. I would suggest he's often accused of being Stalinesque, but of course he's not. He's, he's very liberal with a capital L. Um, and then you can have um, religious liberals with a capital L. Um, so you know, I know many religious people that. When I ask them, are you liberal or authoritarian, they're absolutely clear and committed to liberalism with a capital L. So the, 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 the war that I'm focused on in my book, The War of Children's Minds, is the war between the people on the left and the people on the right, between the liberals and the authoritarians, not the battle between the atheists and the religious believers, the top-bottom battle. Um, in fact, it seems to me that we focus slightly too much on that battle. You know, with Richard Dawkins sends a salvo of attacks northwards, and then there's a return of fire, and there's so a great deal of smoke and heat is generated by that battle, and we completely lose sight of what is perhaps the more fundamental and important battle, the battle between the liberals and the authoritarians, whom you find on both sides of the religious um, slash atheist. Uh, divide. And it might be that people like me, Richard Dawkins, can make common cause with many religious liberals in fighting against authoritarianism with a capital A. I think we should. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting that you refer to Richard Dawkins because he is associated with the new atheists, right? Uh, and I would like to ask you, because I mean, I'm also an atheist, but sometimes I get a bit uneasy with some of the approaches that the new atheists have to religion because sometimes it seems to me that they are somewhat getting into a sort of groupish thinking against religion and simply bashing religious people because I mean religion is a very interesting phenomenon to study both on an anthropological and cognitive level and social level and sometimes it seems to me that religious people are simply dismissed by atheists as stupid or something like that and we don't really get to a position where we can establish sort of a bridge between us as atheists and religious people, intellectually speaking, let's say. Yeah, this is a very complicated um, issue. Um, so I would want to distinguish between individuals, mm -hmm. believers, religious people, um, who right. are often extremely smart and intelligent, and what they believe, 
which may be, in some cases, extraordinarily dumb. So, you know, there are religious people who believe the entire universe is 6,000 years old. Well, that's a really ridiculous thing to be grown up to believe. And yet you'll find PhD qualified, <laughs> highly intelligent people defending that view. So, um, so I don't want to say that religious people are dumb, um, but I do think that many religious beliefs are pretty dumb. Um, and I don't think we should um, be shy about saying that. Um, many uh, new atheists get at least this much right, it seems to me, that we are overly respectful of religion traditionally. Mm -hmm. We have felt that we mustn't say what we actually think, uh, that we have to temper everything we say, dress it up in the most respectful, warlock tugging way when we address religious people. Um, and I, there's no justification for that at all, it seems to me. Um, we should just treat religious beliefs the same way that we treat political beliefs that we don't much like. You know, they're not deserving of special respect and all we have to, you know, bite our, lip, bite our lips and not say what we really think and, and, and bow down every time we, we address them. No, screw that. <laughs> we should just say what we think straight up. If they don't like it, they don't like it. And of course, if you do do that and people are used to a particular kind of respect, uh, then it seems like you're being terribly rude. But you're not. You're just refusing to play the usual traditional game. So that's a point that many atheists, new atheists have made. I've certainly heard Richard Dawkins make that point. And I think that's a good point. Yeah, I'll stop there because I've probably said enough on that topic. Unless you wanted to follow up, follow up question. Follow up your question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So going back to the question about liberalism, because you've already explained very well the part about freedom of thought, at least. But since we are taking into account our current political environment, perhaps it's better to clarify why we may, you make a distinction between freedom of thought and freedom of action. Because I guess that some people, particularly people from the right and the conservatives, would immediately say that, oh, we can't really embrace liberalism because with that we wouldn't be able to teach our children proper behavior and we mm. wouldn't have any sort of authoritative figures when it comes to trying to control our behavior in social environments, let's say. Yeah, so obviously that, that, that the view you've just outlined is, is, is muddled because it's muddling up Mm -hmm. uh, liberalism with a capital L and liberalism with a small L and authority with so yeah so clearly um, we no doubt we do need institutions like the police and the judiciary and so on um, we do need to control behavior to some extent even in the most liberal with a capital L of societies I mean the United States of America prides itself on its freedom uh, in particular the freedom to express your opinion and say what you believe and not not be you know not be discriminated against because of that um and yet at the same time you know they have uh, rules about how fast you can drive uh rules about behavior you know you can get in trouble with the police just just in just the same way there as you can in any other country so yeah so i i think that um the focus should be on freedom of thought and expression particularly in schools particularly when it comes to moral and religious matters um Far too many people, um, you even find some atheists um, uh, saying things like, well, yeah, but y young people need to, you know, be immersed in a tradition first and uh, it should be a religious tradition. And, and that involves just accepting uncritically to begin with. And only later on do we allow them to start, you know, thinking for themselves because, you know, thought requires a tradition. You can't, you can't have thought and critical thinking without having first been immersed in some tradition, you find those kind of arguments uh, being offered. And um, there really is no good case for um, not allowing young people, uh, very young people, age five, you know, um, to start thinking about moral um, and religious matters. They're interested in those topics. They start asking questions quite spontaneously. What we do is we shut them up very often. We stop them asking the questions because they're difficult questions and we don't want to answer them. We can't answer them <laughs> in some cases. Um, 
Uh, but I, it seems to me it's actually it's very, it's very good for them to start thinking and implying their own intelligence. And all the evidence suggests not only that they can do it, you know, there have been many studies, many studies have been done with uh, P4C type programs, philosophy for children, where they don't so much do academic philosophy, but they engage in a kind of philosophical discussion. It turns out that's extremely good for young kids. It improves, you know, they're measurably more intelligent um, after doing it. Uh, in, in some of the pilot studies that have been done. But it also improves the culture of the school, it turns out. You know, there's less bullying, there's more respect, more mutual respect amongst pe pupils and so on. So why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, it seems to me that all the evidence suggests that really that is what the, the kind of attitude that we should be instilling in young people. And it would be a terrible mistake to tell young people that it's not for them to think and question, and that they should just accept this for the time being. Maybe later on we'll let you have a little think, but for the time being you're just going to be accepting this. This is your belief, like it or not. This is what you will believe. That, that is not on, it seems to me. Um, um, and in fact, it's potentially quite dangerous to raise young people uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that this connects quite well with what some people nowadays call uh, our moral crisis in the West, because I guess that from several years now, people, people have been pushing for this narrative that particularly from the 60s onward, people in the West have been through a sort of moral crisis that has even been aggravating. And I guess that mm. uh, through people, through authors like uh, Steven Pinker, for example, I guess that we've already determined that that's not really right and that over the decades we've been improving quite a lot in terms of moral behavior and respecting yeah. people's rights, human rights and minorities' rights and things like that. So <clears throat> do, do you think that uh, people who push for a narrative of a moral crisis or uh, problems in the world getting worse over time, that what they're trying to do is simply to uh, lead people more and more toward the political extremes, both on the right and the left, and causing problems that we could avoid if we were to objectively look at how things are going on. Uh, mm. Well, mm, that's a good question. Um, so from the perspective of a, an evangelical Christian in the United States of America, um, from their perspective, you know, things probably are getting morally worse. If, if their focus is really on, you know, sex, which for some strange reason, <laughs> uh, Christians are very often obsessed with sex um, and what people get up to in the bedroom. Um, you know, given, given the kind of liberalisation that happened in the 60s, the sexual revolution, uh, the rights of gay people and so on to um, live the kind of life that the rest of us have been able to lead forever, um, they see that as a terrible, terrible thing, I I immorality. So it's not, that they, it's not that they're inventing it, I wouldn't want to accuse them of that, they, they genuinely do think that there's, a, that there's growing immorality, and indeed there is, uh, at least in some respects, when, when you uh, are measuring it in the way that they measure it against those particular standards of behaviour, um, moral standards. Um, but of course they're just wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's just a mistake to suppose that there's anything sinful or immoral about being gay or having a gay partner, that's just a mistake, they're just wrong about that. There's no justification for um, that attitude. Um, the other thing you mentioned is that isn't aren't these um, isn't this kind of to hell in a handbasket narrative, which you often hear. Usually, you hear it from people on the right, though, not so much on the left. Um, isn't it being used to politically manipulate people into more extreme positions? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I think that you could probably make, I mean, I'm not an expert on this and it's an empirical question and I'm an armchair theoriser, so I'm not like really well placed to answer it. But my suspicion is that, yes, the, um, the, the political right made a, a decision at some point to try to use religion for a political end, to identify 
certain Republican values and certain Christian values, bring the two, fuse the two together so that people felt that they had no choice but to then very strongly support uh, the Republican cause if they were good Christians. I'm sure very, you know, that works. Um, religion has always historically been co-opted by political groups. It's powerful stuff. Religion is highly emotive. You can stir up feelings, strong feelings, anger, love, resentment, and so on. And you can get people to do things that you would never otherwise be able to get them to do because they now think that they've got the one true God on their side and that they're doing God's bidding. Now, once people believe that, they will do quite extraordinary, some quite extraordinary things that they wouldn't otherwise do. So it's highly potent stuff, religion. And of course, politics politicians have traditionally tried to make use of it. It's an extremely useful tool. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's important that we have a politically secular society so that um, we separate church and state and we ensure that, um, uh, that you know, there is freedom to practice religion, freedom to express your religious beliefs and so on, as long as they're not harming people. Um, but we do not privilege any one religion and we do not elevate it and say, and this is the state religion and uh, uh, then start imposing it on people. We should not be uh, we should not be in the business of doing that. The state should be neutral with respect to religious uh, belief. If you don't have that, then inevitably religious religion starts to poison things. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm a political sec secularist for that reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last topic, and going back to religious, uh, religion and religious thinking, uh, in your work you refer sometimes to the problem of evil, or perhaps as some religious people frame it, the, the, um, the problem of, of good or the good God hypothesis or some something like that. So, uh, if and when in a debate between religious people and atheist people we come to, to, to a point where we're trying to imagine, oh, if there was a God with what we observe happening in the world and in the universe, uh, how should we think of him or it as someone good or someone bad or some, someone somewhere in between those two extremes? So, could you please tell us what is what are some of the issues that happen when people get into that debate between religious and atheist people? Right. Well, <clears throat> you find that um, uh, religious people who believe in a God that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good... <clears throat> um, when you then present them with what's known as the evidential problem of evil, the fact that there's a, an enormous amount of suffering in the universe, um, <clears throat> and so much so um, that it seems highly implausible, highly unlikely that there's some God-justifying reason for every last ounce of it. You know? Well, given that an all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good God would not allow pointless suffering. It may allow suffering, but there's going to have to be a reason for it. There's not going to be gratuitous suffering. Given that there, so far as many of us are concerned, there pretty obviously is, <laughs> from God's perspective, gratuitous, gratuitous, not just suffering, but gratuitous suffering. Well, um, it, it strikes us as pretty obvious then that there's, there's, there's no such God. I mean, maybe there's some consciousness, some intelligence behind the universe. Maybe it's all powerful. But if, it, if, if there is such a being, it clearly is all good. Um, uh, so there is that classic objection that you, that you mentioned. Um, how, do, how do religious people respond to that? Uh, in a variety of ways. So sometimes they try and cook up some reasons that God might have for the suffering. You know, it's the character building purposes or it's a product of our free will, our acting freely, or <clears throat> there are innumerable explanations that they offer but uh, even the religious people traditionally <laughs> very often admit that these explanations really only go so far and the fact is that um, there's an awful lot of suffering that they just can't really plausibly explain 
Um, so then they play a slightly different card, um, the mystery card. Mm -hmm. um, and there are more or less plausible versions of this. Um, so probably the most plausible version is called Skeptical Theism, which is a slightly misleading title. It's, it's not that people are skeptical about theism. They're not, but, no, these are theists. They believe in God, but they're skeptical about our ability to know the reasons that God might have for allowing uh, the terrible suffering that we see in the universe. Um, they say that, you know, God could easily be aware of reasons that we're ignorant of that would uh, justify him in allowing this suffering. How do you know that there aren't such reasons? Well, the only reason you've got for thinking that there are no such reasons is that you can't think of any. But, you know, why, sh why should you be able to think of them? Uh, you're just a finite human being with very limited you know, cognitive powers. So you're really not justified in supposing that there isn't such a reason. And if you're not justified in supposing there isn't such a reason, you're not justified in supposing that there are any gratuitous evils, any gratuitous suffering at all. So that, that's about as sophisticated as it gets, I think, probably in terms of responses to the problem of evil. Um, but even that, I think, is, is, is not going to work. Um, I mean, one problem with it, it seems to me, is that once you say, well, for all I know, there could be <clears throat> some God-justifying reason for God to do so-and-so, and then you're going to have to admit that there could be a God-justifying reason for God to deceive us in various ways. Maybe there's a God-justifying reason for God to deceive us into thinking that there is an external world. How do you know that there isn't? You don't? Well, then you, <laughs> you can't reasonably believe that there's an external world. Um, Maybe the God has a reason to deceive us into thinking that Christianity is true when it is not. How do you know that there isn't such a reason? You don't. Your sceptical theism is true. Therefore, you can't know that Christianity is true. This is quite bad news, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, right? If you're, if you're a practicing Christian. Um, so, yeah, so it turns out that the skepticism that's employed by the sceptical theist uh, runs rampant. You know, it's kind of Pandora's box problem. It suddenly spreads to all sorts of other things that the theist is really not very keen on being sceptical about, including their own religious faith. Um, so, yeah, so I think even that card ultimately uh, is going to fail. It seems to me pretty obvious, actually, that there is no all-powerful, knowing, all-good God. I don't know why consciousness exists. I don't know why the universe exists and so on. It's a mystery. Uh, I've got some ideas, but, you know, I can't answer these questions. Does that mean I should believe in God? No, don't be ridiculous. I mean... I can still reasonably rule out various explanations. I can reasonably rule out an all-powerful, all-evil God. Because, you know, look around you. Too much love, laughter, ice cream and rainbows for this to be the creation of a supremely powerful and malevolent deity. And if we can rule that out, and we all know we can, right, then why can't we reasonably rule out a good God on much the same basis? You know, far too much, far too much pointless pain and suffering in the universe for this to be the creation of a all powerful, all good deity. Uh, it's as plain as the nose on your face. Uh, the real mystery, it seems to me, is why people can't see something uh, as plain as the nose on their face. Um, they are very, very, very good at explaining what's staring them in the face uh, away, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Law, let, let's end the interview here, but just before we go, would you like to tell people, uh, so I've already referred to a couple of your books in the introduction, I'm, and I'm going to leave links to your work in the description box of the video, but would you like to tell people if there are some good online resources that they could go to if they want to learn more about your work? Um, well, I've got a, I've got a blog, um, so I'm Stephen Law on Patreon for the blog there, and then I've got another blog at www.stephenlaw.org. So you can find some of my stuff on there. Um, I post fairly regularly. Um, and then I'm on Twitter as um, at StephenLaw60. Uh, again, Stephen with a PH, not a V. Um, and so I tweet uh, occasionally on philosophy and other matters. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you, yeah, you, you might enjoy having a look at that stuff if you're interested in what I have to say. 
Um, and then, you know, my books uh, include uh, The Philosophy Gym, that's probably still one of my favourites, 25 Short Adventures in Thinking. Um, and then I wrote a children's philosophy book, which is called now called, I think, The Complete Philosophy Files, which has jokes and illustrations and encourages children to think and question, which is very much, of course, what I've been arguing for in this um, in this conversation we've been having, so yeah, so I've written, you know, I've written a book, philosophy book for children, which um, for young people, age sort of ten and up, uh, which they might enjoy. Yeah, mm-hmm. the complete philosophy files. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I will include links to all of that in the description box of the interview, Doctor Law. Mm-hmm. And again, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. It was really a delightful conversation. So thank you. No. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great interview. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, if you don't like Patreon, you can also go to PayPal or subscribe star all of the links are in the description box of the video and also on my channel uh, and apart from that you can also of course leave a like share the interview and hit the subscription button i would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons karen litzke and blanchett perel galarsen law guerrero chantel gelinas jim frank francis ford Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, and my first producer, Isar Webe. Thank you for all.